Uh, so today I'm uh, so I'm Danny Fei, and today I'm going to uh, like I'm very glad to talk about the Navalina method of analytic continuation here. Uh, so we will start with the motivation. So why do we need the analytic continuation? Um, in quantum statistical mechanics, we have our core objects, the partition function and also the Green's function. Um, they depend on the Hamiltonian of our quantum system and also on the beta, which is the inverse temperature. Um, and in finite temperature field theories, um, this beta is usually paired with the imaginary time tau, which equals to I times the real time T. And with this um, imaginary time formalism, many calculations are made available, uh, such as the um, self-consistent diagrammatic methods in the simulations of um, materials. And we also know that a lot of the objects can be derived from the Green's function and uh, compared directly to the experiments, but uh, they always can be um, derived from the real time and real frequency Green's function. Uh, so a formalism is in need to transform our Green's function defined on the imaginary axis to a Green's function that is defined on the real axis where we can obtain our real time or frequency Green's functions. And um, according to this picture here, for example, the retarded Green's function it has always posed lying below the real line. And uh, also when we are considering the mass of our Green's function on the positive imaginary axis, um, they can be represented consistently with one formula um, by replacing this omega and the i omega with a single variable c and let c to be in the upper half complex plane. Um, and uh, uh, numerically, we can do uh, so. Yes, so a procedure is neat, and that that is the analytic continuation. And numerically, we can find such a kernel that is relating the um, Green's function in the real frequency and imaginary frequency. It is an integral kernel uh, which convolves those two quantities. And if we discretize it into a matrix inverted and times with our g i omega, we will get our g omega. But there is a, a problem that this kernel is often, is always ill-conditioned so that uh, when we have small changes on the massive error axis, such as in this example here, we have our three sets of data which collapse onto each other almost. And when they're transformed into the real frequency Green's function and uh, uh, interpreted as the spectral function, they are very different from each other. So the takeaway point here is analytic continuation is very hard in practice for the Green's function. And it is very sensitive to noise on the Matsubara axis. Um, and I will also add a few remarks. The first is that uh, like for the numerical analytic continuation, um, in general, we cannot find a single uh, analytic function that passed through all our interpolation nodes with the given values. This is because our sampling points, so our nodes, they are often discrete and not like simply connected as a subset of the complex line. And the second remark is that even if we are given this kernel, integral kernel here, uh, we are not guaranteed that our Green's function on the real axis, it is uh, like causal and physical. Um, here by physical, I mean that the imaginary part should be strictly a uh, smaller or equal to zero so that our spectral function is greater or equal to zero um, on the whole real line. So this is not guaranteed. And our current methods of analytic continuation, there are two mainstreams. The first one is the interpolation methods and the second is the fitting methods. And the representatives of them is the Pidge interpolance and the maximum entropy we see that for PJ is just a general rational interpolant with no further con, um, causality constraints. So often we'll find some negative features in our spectral functions. 
And uh, uh, like maximum entropy, what it does is it uses the exact kernel and then enforce the spectral function to be strictly causal, so positive. Um, and then it fit the imaginary data that we give it. Uh, so um, the maximum entropy often will work uh, reasonably well for the noisy data, uh, given the reasonable spectrum functions, um, but it will lose some resolution, just as this picture showing here that the band structure is rarely resolved. Um, and it is not a method for some more accurate um, input data, like coming out of the semi-analytic um, methods with closed form solutions. So those data are often uh, more accurate and our maximum entropy cannot resolve them. And we come across with a new method, which is the Navalina method for analytical continuation. Um, and uh, all things begins with an observation that the negative of the Green's function is actually a Navalina function. So a Navalina function means that it maps the upper half complex plane to the upper half complex plane, including the boundary. So the boundary of the upper half complex plane is the real line. And I sketch a proof here. So we expand the Green's function in the lemma representation and try to prove that each cement here is um, uh, strictly have a negative um, imaginary part. So the factor A here is greater than zero. And if we try to parametrize it with C um, equal to X plus YI and make C in the upper half complex plane, then it is direct to show that the imaginary part of each cement is smaller or equal to zero, which means when we are summing all the cements, we will get our imaginary part of the negative Green's function, which is greater or equal to zero for all the C in the upper half plane. Um, and we can check this um, Navalina function theory, like uh, for each Navalina function, we know that it emits a representation showing here, uh, like C is a real constant, D is a non-negative constant, and here mu lambda, it is the measure function, and it should be strictly positive on the whole real line. We can see uh, remarkably that this third term um, is actually our Green's function structure. It involves this integral kernel. And we have an additional term, which is the last term. And this term, it regulates that our measure function for each Navalina function, it will decay um, fast enough to zero so that this term will finally give a finite real value, which can be compensated by this C, the real constant C here. We can also set the D equals to zero so that um, we know that our Green's function um, kernel is restored and our Green's function is a subspace of the Navalina space. So in the next slide, I will introduce the continuation algorithm for um, Navalina functions. And in numerical simulation um, analytical continuations, um, if we are giving the high frequency tail and extending to a high enough frequency, we see here that if we have a function which is zero strictly at infinity in all the radial directions in the upper half complex plane, then this C should um, cancels out the last term and D should be strictly zero. So in the simulation, if we are giving the precise high frequency tail, then almost always we will restore the Green's function kernel. This is to say that our solution space for the Navalina analytical continuation will restore the Green's function on subspace. Okay, so here's the algorithm, and we use the modified Shor's algorithm, which is originated by uh, Isai Shor in 1918. Uh, where he parametrized each Navalina function with a continued fraction expansion. And here, uh, we first used the Riemann mapping theorem to show that each Navalina function is equivalent to either a contractive function or a Shor function by doing a holographic mapping. And we used the holographic mapping, which is the Mobius transform here. C plus, it is the upper half complex plane, while D here is the unit disk, which is a subset of a complex claim and each num complex numbers there has the modular smaller than one 
And by overlying, we, as usual, denote the boundary inclusion of the boundary. Uh, we show, so the short algorithm is actually a reductive algorithm. And we show the first step here on the second line. So theta c uh, has this expression. And if we replace c with y1 here, we'll find that this term and this term, they will equal to zero. So theta y1 is equal to gamma one, collapsing with our uh, sampling data that theta y1 is gamma one. Um, yeah, just to remind, so theta here is a contractive function, which is mapped from the Navalina function. And if we let c equals to y2 to ym, um, then this theta tilde is completely determined by theta at the nodes y2 to ym. So this means that by this first step of the reduction, we've reduced the interpolation problem of m nodes to an interpolation of m minus one nodes because theta tilde is completely free at the node, the first node y1. And doing this step that by step, and finally we will reach a continued fraction expansion. Here, theta m plus one is completely um, free uh, at all the nodes and it is an arbitrary contractive function. A, C, B, C, 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 D, C here, they are just rational function um, and they are determined entirely by our input nodes and um, input data. So here, um, A, B, C, D, they are the fixed degrees of freedom of our interpolant and theta M plus one is the remaining degree, free degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. So we now have a class of solutions for our interpolation problem and thereby construction Navalina. And uh, what we are uh, trying to do is to find one of the solution that we want um, by using some standard. And here we notice that if we take the theta m plus one to zero, um, let it to be a constant function zero, uh, then our spectral function will be oscillating. So uh, what we are trying to do is to, we uh, use theta m plus one to try to find the smoothest spectral function. So and set that as our goal. Uh, so we want to choose a solution by doing an optimization. Um, so our first thought is to parameterize this theta m plus one by a basis of the contractive function space, um, because that is what we want. We want an arbitrary contractive function or by a Navalina function or sure function space and then do the holographic mapping. Um, but up to now, we have now managed to find such a um, like complete and orthogonal basis for those causal function space. So what we do instead, and can be reasoned by this, is that uh, we have the contractive functions and they are lying in the Hardy infinity space because they have a finite maximum value, a modular value in the upper half complex plane. And we know that the Hardy infinity space is entirely contained in the Hardy two space. So we use a basis of the Hardy two space to span our contracted function space space. And we set our objective function to be as such. And this last term is of course our smoothening norm, which is the second derivative n square. The first term is a normalization term and regulating our norm of the spectral function to be one. And on the right, I'm showing here like the third order and 20th order of the Hardy basis. We uh, shown that in the uh, third order, like um, they are varying uh, rapidly around the origin. And uh, when we are increasing the order on um, the ripples, they spread out. So this is the effect that we want. We want to parameterize the variations around our origin and in the energy window that we want. Here is some preliminary results where we have our synthetic benchmark system. The things that we do here is that we construct um, the spectral functions, which are either the delta peaks or the uh, various Gaussian peaks. And then we do a back continuation to the imaginary axis and sample there. Uh, so we take those sampling um, Matsubara Green's function data as our input for the Navalina analytic continuation and then perform the continuation. This gives us the uh, blue lines and then we try to do a hardy optimization and that will finally give us the red line. And the dashed lines are the exact data. So it's the spectral function that we are inputting. 
we see that they collapse onto each other, the after optimization and exact curves showing um, a small triangle of our uh, method. And also on the right hand side, we find that in the lower uh, panel, so the needed and the fitted um, theta n plus one, they are very close um, to each other on the energy window. And if we, if we expand our support, uh, we can cover the higher frequency and do the um, like do the optimization quite well. And remarkably, we also have another mathematical tool, which is the PIG criterion, which is formulated by George Pig um, in about 1918. And uh, what this criterion is um, telling us is that uh, we can know the existence and uniqueness of a class of uh, causal interpolants that can interpolate interpret our um, data that we are feeding it. So uh, what the big criterion says is that if we have a sure function, which we know is equivalent to a Navalina function, and uh, we have some sampling data on it, so xi are the um, nodes in the unit disk, and yi are the values at those nodes for g, we can con always construct a big matrix which is only parametrized by xi and yi, which are the input data. So that is to say, um, only by giving the input data, we can know exactly the existence and uniqueness of a class of, um, class of causal solutions to our interpolation or continuation problem. When this big matrix is um, greater or equal to zero, meaning it is semi positive, semi-definite, then there exists a class of causal solutions. And when this big matrix is furthermore singular, there's only a unique solution. And on the right, I'm showing a typical spectrum of the peak matrix. Uh, we can see that there are a few agent values, which is a little below the real axis. And examples also show that if we are adding some noise with standard deviation of ye minus three to our mesobaric Green's function sampling data, then the smallest agent value is typically about minus ye minus three. So that means that, um, and this is worse than here of the order of minus y minus 19. So uh, at least a very uh, like uh, negative smallest agent value indicates that we have, our data is already contaminated and we have noise there uh, like for the um, quantum multicolor simulation data. Um, and with those noisy data, our Navalina cannot perform that well. You see that uh, on the left hand hot side, that is the 1e e minus 4. So uh, here I add four random set of noise onto our data, which is of standard deviation 1e e minus 4. And on the right, that is 1e e minus 6. We see that for the 1e e minus 4, it is up to chance that we will have good spectrum or um, bad spectrum here is already after the opt optimization. So there are some unmovable um, bad spectrum that cannot be fixed. Um, and this is because the poles are very close to the real axis. And for some of them, the poles will be a little bit lower. Um, and uh, so we can also not get additional information like uh, some error bars or others for our uh, simulation. So this just means that Nemalina is not the method for the noisy data. And uh, finally, yeah, so we can also combine the hamburger moment problem with our Nemalina um, interpolation. That is because uh, like there is a theorem called the hamburger Nemalina theorem that relates the moments with the, um, our Nemalina functions. So the hamburger moment problem is as such. So we have a list of moments and they are defined in a probability sense. In our case, we can interpret this sigma omega as uh, a omega times d omega. So here, a omega is our spectral function. By the hamburger Navalina theorem, we know that a subset of the Navalina space which have this integral kernel, and we find that this is just the kernel of our Green's function. So such a Navalina function, it can be expanded asymptotically with this expression. Um, so the moments are 
um, claimed to be the coefficients for the principal part of our expression. And we know that in simulations, we can actually get those moments um, not very hardly. So um, the first moment is the norm of the spectral function. The second norm uh, moment is the energy density and so on. Okay, so uh, we've introduced a scalar case. Uh, so it's the single particle Green's function continuation. We can also generalize it to the matrix valued Green's Yes. Um, can you see my screen? All right. Let's just start with the clarity of the order again. Okay. Uh, so uh, we've introduced our scalar case. So the single particle Green's function analytic continuation. And we can also generalize it to the matrix valued correlation function interpolation. Um, and what we are doing here is the matrix valued Green's function self-energy and cumulant, which is defined as the Green's function by losing um, the Fock matrix contribution. And um, by matrix valued Green's function, we mean a matrix that is um, representing our system that we are looking into. And on the diagonal um, elements, they are the single particle um, on the single orbital Green's function that we've um, just considered. And on the off diagonal elements, we will have our um, single particle Green's function, um, but creation and annihilation of particles happen at different orbitals. So uh, this function has uh, also a domain, which is the upper half complex plane. It has its range is um, the matrix value. So they are all matrices at each point. Um, and we've proved that uh, so the Green's function, self-energy and cumulant up to an imaginary unit, they are all within the Carothergy class. And a sketch of proof is here. So for the Green's function, we use the uh, lemma representation. For the cumulant, we use its definition. And we know that the inverse of a Carothergy class function is still Carothergy. So this can tell us that the cumulant is also Carothergy. And for the self-energy, we are looking into this paper. And it is saying that if we have a completely uh, general Hamiltonian, which is time dependent, and also have a general interaction term, uh, we can always find an effective Hamiltonian by adding additional path orbitals to our um, Hamiltonian and doing um, kinds of a unitary complementation. Um, and using this effective Hamiltonian, uh, we can formulate our self-energy of the original interacting Hamiltonian on um, its physical orbitals. Um, so the original orbitals as such, it has two terms and it has some parameters like the uh, U here is the interaction parameter and also the HIJ, HIS. So they are the um, parameter of the matrix entries of the effective Hamiltonian. Um, and we also know that this term, the hartree fock term, it is like T and T prime should be equal to each other. So when we are doing the Fourier transform to this term, it should be seen independent. And uh, this term is also Hermitian. So this, um, with this fact and the uh, formalism, those three formulas, we can, with some arithmetics, prove that the um, self-energy up to an imaginary unit is also within the Carothergy class. And there is, of course, the generalized Schwarz algorithm and generalized peak criterion as um, a generalized of the Navalina analytic continuation. So in the generalized Schwarz algorithm, this is within the first step, like we are just um, reducing a problem with m nodes to with m minus one nodes, another problem. And in the PIC criterion, we can, again, um, using only the input sampling data to tell us to construct the matrices and by the uh, positive semi-definiteness and the singularity of this matrix, we can know whether we have a class of solution, a unique solution, or we have no solutions. And on the right, I'm showing like the matrix value spectrum, it has almost a very similar distribution with a scalar case. 
Um, and here are showing our first example. So it's a two-side hover model where we are adding a magnetic field and also a symmetry breaking term to give us more rich feature on our spectrum. So um, down here, we are having the uh, two, two entries, three, one entries, and four, two entries of the Green's function and self energy and evaluated a little above the real axis. And we see that this G22 is the measuring part is strictly smaller or equal to zero, which is what we will expect from the spectral function. And here, the off diagonal entries, they are our new features. So we've um, successfully used our matrix value interpolation to interpolate those entries and um, using the mathematical structures of the causal uh, correlation functions, we actually um, constrain the diagonal elements and off diagonal elements with each other so that we are getting more constraints and more information um, from the same matrix valued functions. And here we are also rotating them into a randomly new basis. Uh, here's the total spectral function. So we see from all those uh, results that the exact results with our, compared with the results that we are getting from the analytical continuations, um, they almost collapse with each other, showing a success of the mathematical formalism of this chirothergy um, interpolation. Here we see that uh, sometimes it will get some negative peaks. Um, that is because it doesn't build in any causality constraints. And we also have the self-consistent GW data for the 26 orbit uh, silicon. This is performed by Jianan. And uh, we see here that what we are doing here is uh, we um, first uh, analytically continue our Green's function, self-energy and cumulant to the real axis. Then on the real axis, we apply the Dyson equation and invert our matrices from self-energy and cumulant back to the Green's function and compare them. We see they are almost exactly the same. And uh, um, so this means the interpolation precision is very high and the formula is correct. And here we see that if we are neglecting the self-energy or the off-diagonal parts of the uh, self-energy, we will get our um, band gaps um, like they, they are not what we uh, exactly seeing here in the exact spectrum, and the band structure is also distorted. Mm. Okay, so I will finally ask, uh, add a little bit comments. So first, our uh, work um, for semi-analytic data, it works um, bad, uh, sorry, it works very well, and uh, also um, like um, methods include the GW facts and T matrix and so on. Um, so it gives it a mathematical structure. And uh, so adding more constraints to our problem, we can also combine it with the moment information and we can know the existence and uniqueness of our solutions. We can also generalize them to the matrix value problems. And there is a set of, of a very good mathematical mathematics that is invented by mathematicians in the 1920s. Um, but our methods are, are not for the noisy case. So noisy case is untouched. If we are looking for some ideas from the Navalina, um, we are expecting that our Navalina can uh, give us more information than Maxent. Um, then that information might be some robust features in the um, interplans, such as the delta peaks or so on. Um, they uh, cannot be discovered by Maxim, but we hope that um, it can be um, like discovered by some modified Novelina. And there are also holographic mapping, Hardy space, and Fourier coefficients, which are closely related to the Novelina peak formalism. We can project to a causal space and then choose a solution from them by either handling the sure interplant or projecting our input data to the um, causal space. Uh, although that might not work very well, and uh, uh, we did uh, some preliminary trials and they do not work. Um, and so finally, how to uh, run the Navalina. Um, I've uh, added a little brochure here. I will also put it into the folder of our Navalina algorithm so that you can have a look at it later. So the dependencies are easy, uh, are simple, uh, only the C++ and the CODA. 
and the linked libraries are MPFR, GMPXX, GMP. So these are, these are multi-precision uh, libraries for arithmetics. And FFTW3, which is a Fourier transform library um, used for the optimization step in our um, algorithm. Uh, so that is used to perform the second derivative. Um, okay, so I will like just uh, do a little demo. So here, um, like, let's go to the folder we have, and then we will first, uh, as usual, um, change directory into build and uh, do a CMake um, and make. So it just compiled two programs. The first of them is the Sobolev, um, and the second of them is the Navalina. So Navalina is for our first step, short algorithm, and Sobolev is for the optimization. And uh, uh, okay, so let's copy some in profile here, uh, which is in the, uh, yeah, uh, so we have one. Oh, yes, so we'll copy this one. Oh, okay. Um, to the build directory and also copy. Be the input.txt uh, to our Okay, so um, so GIF one is the uh, input data of our uh, continuation. In the first column, we have the massive error frequencies; they are uh, increasing. And for the second and third column, they are the real and imaginary part of our uh, Green's function data. And the input.txt, it is a parameter file for the C++ program. The first parameter is the file name of our uh, imaginary data. The second is the number of nodes in our um, data. And the third and fourth is the output parameters. So they are the file name of the spectral function and also a coefficient file, which is the value of A, C, B, C, 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 D, C at the evaluation nodes. We want it because we can just uh, use it in the optimization step, avoiding like running the Navalina program again. Yes, um, to run it, we redirect the uh, input parameters to Navalina and it will uh, run automatically and uh, uh, we will get our a.txt. So this is the spectral function. We have the frequencies in our spectrum and also the coif. Uh, so it will have nine columns. The first column is the uh, real frequency and uh, the remaining columns are the real and imaginary part of A, C, B, C, 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 D, C at the evaluation nodes. And um, they contain all the fixed information for our interpolant after the um, short algorithm. Okay, so now we are going to perform the second step, which is the optimization. We create a directory and put our needed uh, script there. Mm. And also like our coefficient file into it. Um, um, so we all together have to do three actions and we first have a look at the first script that we are going to uh, run. This will uh, write all the um, needed uh, parameter files for the optimization program that we are going to use, which is the coda. So the first input file, it defines the method. So it's an initialization file. It will define the method that we are going to use, which is the conjugate gradient minimizer. It also has some parameters that you can 
uh, take a look at the website of Dakota, what does that mean? And uh, we have our second file, which is important, which is a driver file. So we write this file and in the optimization progress, Dakota will run the driver file uh, written by us. And in each step, it will um, call a program written by us, which is the sublift that we've just, uh, we've just compiled. And here we define all the parameters for the sublift. Um, the first is the execution path. The second is the basis, um, number of bases that we are need. So here I set it to 15, uh, meaning that we have fifth, order 15 bases and times four on the original and conjugate and also the uh, real and imaginary part of the basis coefficients. Eta is um, like how distant we want our evaluation axis from the real axis. And coefficient file uh, is just the name of the coefficient file, which is coif. And um, during the optimization, um, the coda it runs our program, which will give an uh, like objective function value, which will be written into the sublift. And then in the next step, the program, like the decoder, it will read on the objective function and decide the new parameters to put into our um, program. So in our sublift, we actually need um, two set of parameters to output a spectral function. The first is the um, basis coefficients decided by the coda, and the second set is the coef, so they are our fixed information of the interpolant. Um, and uh, also this params.txt uh, is written by the coda uh, with all the basis coefficients it decides to put. Um, and we also write a template for the coda to uh, put its um, parameters. Um, okay, so we will just like run the script. It will submit a job um, and um, then so it will give some results and we will just like use a result to analyze the results and uh, like run a job script. And finally, um, it will give the spectral function corresponding to the optimized uh, set of parameters, which is the optimized basis coefficients. Okay, so that's all, yeah. Okay, great, yeah, thanks a lot. Um,